it's been a long time since we met last time or last year and a lot of things happened during uh, this time of course pandemic which uh, changed the world completely and also uh, resolution of the armenia azerbaijan nagorno karabakh conflict which uh, changed the region and uh, now the new situation in the region completely new azerbaijan resolved the conflict which lasted for almost 30 years resolved by force and by political means and i can only agree with uh, what uh, president putin said the president of one of the co-chair countries that uh, nagorno-karabakh conflict is already in the history uh, i share this view uh, unfortunately Minsk group didn't play any role in the resolution of the conflict though Minsk group uh, had the mandate to do it for 28 years. Uh, I participated in negotiations uh, for the last 17 years. And as I said, during the war, though uh, there has been an activity of the Minsk group in uh, elaborating uh, ideas and uh, trying to be creative, but there was no result. And this is the reality. Therefore, Azerbaijan resolved it itself. And by uh, defeating Armenia on the battlefield, we forced Agresta to uh, admit its defeat, to sign declaration, which uh, we consider is an act of capitulation of Armenia and uh, also all the political uh, forces of Armenia, except the ruling regime, share this view, that this is a capitulation. They call it a humiliating capitulation. And responsibility, full responsibility, is on Pashinyan dictatorship regime. Uh, as I said, uh, I participate as a president participated for 17 years. I had experience in uh, negotiating with previous Armenian presidents. And uh, though there had been no result, but there was process. Pashinyan ruined the process. He ruined the negotiation format. He tried to do it. His provocative statements and actions made negotiations uh, absolutely meaningless. I several times referred to what he said and what he did, and uh, that was absolutely unacceptable. His provocative, insulting actions and statements uh, against Azerbaijan and its people had to be addressed, and we punished him severely. So he had to admit his defeat. He had to plea for ceasefire. Actually, that was he was doing during almost all 44 days of the war. And he was calling world leaders several times a day. It's uh, very difficult to find any uh, European leader whom he didn't call. Uh, and uh, he was asking for ceasefire but he didn't want to uh, implement my conditions. Actually, one condition. He put uh, seven conditions to me several months ago. I rejected them. I said, I have only one. Get out of our lands. Uh, otherwise, you will see the iron fist of Azerbaijan. So, uh, during the war, several times, I said, as soon as Pashinyan himself, not his ministers, himself, uh, gives us a date when he will get out of our land, we will stop. And that happened. 
I kept my word, as I always do. Pashinyan never kept his word, neither in front of me nor in front of his own people. He is a liar. And I think people of Armenia already know that. And he continues to lie even now. But that's already uh, has nothing to do with Azerbaijan. That's internal uh, politics of Armenia. So as soon as uh, on the uh, 10th of November, the night from 9th to 10th of November, he signed a uh, declaration, we stopped immediately. The next uh, hour, the war stopped. But, uh, we also gave uh, time for withdrawal. And then after the request from uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin, we even uh, gave additional 10 days for them to leave Kalbaja. Though when uh, Armenian gangs and Armenian army were ethnically cleansing Kalbajar, they didn't give a day to Azerbaijanis. They killed them. They forced them to leave. Azerbaijanis from Kalbajar had to go through the high mountains, 3,500 meters high. That was uh, beginning of April, very cold, and many of them got frost. So we gave them additional time. What they've done? They started to burn the houses. The houses which they did not build. They started to destroy everything. Uh, I was informed just uh, several days ago that they've destroyed all the water power stations which uh, existed there. Destroyed completely. They burned our forests. They cut our trees. They behaved, they continue to behave as barbarians. There is no other way how to name those who do it. But we kept our work. We stopped war. If we didn't stop war, everybody knows what would have happened. Armenian army was completely destroyed, demoralized, and uh, had no means to, to do anything. Uh, we demonstrated courage. We demonstrated uh, spirit. We demonstrated professionalism on the battlefield. We destroyed the myths Armenians were creating for decades about unbeatable Armenian army. We demonstrated that Azerbaijani army is unbeatable. And uh, within 44 days, we liberated big part of the occupied territories, including the ancient Azerbaijani city of Shusha, and more than 300 cities, villages, and other settlements. So we showed who is who. And uh, when I visited the liberated territories, I just witnessed what I heard a lot about, and I've seen in some internet sites, what they've done to our territories. There have been no single building in Fizuli. All the buildings were leveled to ground. Uh, there was no buildings even to put a flag, Azerbaijani flag on. In Agdam, uh, the only not completely destroyed uh, building was a mosque. And when we started to uh, investigate why they did not destroy it completely, uh, our people said that, that because they needed to have some, uh, some building in Agdam just to, to measure the distance. Uh, so if Azerbaijani army uh, goes on uh, offensive, so it will be easier for them to measure the distance. So the mosque uh, was a kind of a uh, rentier for them. But we didn't go to Agdam. We, we went where they did not expect us. We came to Agdam without one single bullet. So why I'm telling that? Because this is true. First, uh, because uh, you visit us after more than one year. 
And I want to be very open and frank with you, as I am open and frank with uh, Azerbaijani people. During all these 44 days, I was telling them the truth, only truth. Pashinyan was lying to his people and to his partners, whom he uh, talked several times a day regularly. And he continues to lie now. But, as I said, it's no longer something which, uh, which is of concern. We resolved the problem. We liberated our territory. During the war, I was many times asked about uh, losses of Azerbaijani army. I said, we will disclose this information after war is over. And we did it. And the number of our heroes our shahids and their names and their photograph is now uh, shown on TV. Uh, during the war I said that we have no intentions to occupy Armenian territory, though as you can imagine we had all the opportunities to do it and still have. But we don't have these intentions. I was asked about that, I said no. Uh, we want to liberate our own territory. We will fight on our own land. And we kept our word. At the same time, I said that uh, for us it's vital to have uh, direct land connections to Nakhchivan, and we achieved it by political means. And Pashinyan signed declaration which uh, provides uh, connection between Azerbaijan and Nakhchivan. This is also an important historical achievement for Azerbaijan. At the same time, it uh, creates uh, opportunities uh, for um, future discussions about how region will perform in the future. Uh, during the war, in the numerous uh, interviews to international media, I was saying that we have nothing, no problems with Armenian people. And uh, our fight is with aggressors, with those criminals who occupy our territory. Armenian people can live, uh, as they do, by the way, in different parts of Azerbaijan now, in uh, safety and dignity. And they will live better under uh, uh, our administration. Uh, we were uh, seen now after the war the uh, villages where Armenians live. It's extreme poverty. You know, it's <laughs> unbelievable how people live there. And uh, what was the, uh, how to say, the purpose of this occupation? The, why Armenians needed for so many years to keep their own people like slaves. I don't know whether you've seen or not uh, during the first days of the war when Azerbaijani army was uh, entering the trenches of Armenian army. Among uh, eliminated uh, occupants, there have been people who were uh, tied with these uh, chains you know, to their leg. <laughs> and these videos were <laughs> shocking videos. They, they forced people to stay in the trenches. They did not allow those who wanted to run away to go back uh, to, to leave their positions. They had a special groups during the war which were standing behind the Armenian troops in order to kill their own people if they, if they will run. And they did it many times. They were criminals attacking Ganja with ballistic missiles and Barda, Tartar with cluster ammunition and phosphor bombs is a war crime. Illegal settlement on the occupied territories, which they did and which they were proud of, is war crime. Sarkisyan, Kacheryan are war criminals. And as I said, in front of the destroyed uh, city, Moscow, Agdam, we defeated Kacharyan and Sarkisyan. 
Uh, they want to put the blame on Pashinyan. As I said, Pashinyan is no one. Is a person by obstacles who was brought by this, you know, movement against criminal Kachirian Sarkisian regime on top of Armenian government. The person who has no experience, no knowledge, uh, no understanding about international relations, about how to run the country. The person who uh, never in his uh, life was heading even a small kalhos. So uh, he is not the only one to blame. Yes, he provoked us. He did things which were unacceptable, and he was punished for that. But we defeated the army of Sarkisian and Kacherian. They were creating this army for 30 years. So uh, these war crimes are now documented. Uh, we, of course, will uh, we already started legal procedures on what they've done to our cities. Uh, we already invited international partners to, uh, to make a proper analysis of the damage they caused to civilians, to uh, our infrastructure, to our historical and religious monuments. And everything will be documented and uh, uh, we will uh, do what is necessary in these uh, circumstances. So illegal settlement is a war crime. And uh, Ms. Group twice officially uh, organized the fact-finding mission to the occupied territories. Once it was called fact-finding, another time it was called uh, field assessment mission. Uh, Andre knows because he is a veteran of this process, he was there. At the same time, Minsk Group co-chairs many times visited occupied territories and witnessed the war crime of Armenian regime, uh, witnessed the total destruction of our cities. It's not only Agdan Fizuli, Jabra is the same. In Kelbajar and Lachin, they, uh, they uh, we're just using some of the houses just to, to settle. And in uh, Gubadli and Zengilan, they were planning to settle Armenians from Syria, uh, whom they used as the mercenaries. There were numerous facts in our hands about mercenaries which Armenians used. I already said uh, whose uh, residents these people are. don't want to repeat but we have passports in our hands. And we have uh, detected foreigners in our prison. So all that, of course, uh, creates a big, uh, raises big question. Why the conflict was not resolved for so many years, despite resolutions of United Nations Security Council, decisions of OEC, decisions of uh, other international organizations? and three um, permanent members of uh, UN Security Council could not uh, use their leverage, use their potential to force Armenia to leave. Even from some of the territories, they could not or they did not want. That's an open question. But now it doesn't make any difference. The conflict is resolved. Azerbaijan did it by military political means. Many times I heard from you and from your leaders and from your high-ranking officials that there is no military solution to the conflict. I was saying there is. And the history shows that I was right. There was. I think that those who were saying that there is no military solution, they realize themselves that there is. They just want it, uh, you know, to keep everything as it is. There have been statements uh, of the presidents of the Minsk Group co-chair countries, I think some 10 years ago, 
and we supported those statements. It created certain hopes. Uh, they were saying in the joint declaration, status quo is unacceptable. Yes, we said yes, good statement. Let's work on that. Now tell it to Armenia. How many times I was telling to you, your predecessors, go and tell Armenia to leave, put pressure on them. How many times I was telling high-ranking officials from your countries, go put pressure on them until it is not too late. But what happened? After such a certain time, leaders of your countries changed this uh, wording. They no longer said status quo is unacceptable. They were saying status quo is not sustainable. That means that for them status quo was acceptable. What other explanation we can have? When they were saying in Aquila, I think in Muskoka, uh, status quo is unacceptable, and then they say status quo is unsustainable. Uh, obviously, they mean, it means that they think the status quo is acceptable. Many uh, politicians thought that the only way how to preserve peace is to keep status quo, and we changed it. And we showed that status quo can be changed by force, by courage, by wisdom, by policy, by uh, concentration of efforts, by solidarity of Azerbaijani people, by the will of Azerbaijani government and the spirit of Azerbaijani people, and bravery of Azerbaijani soldier. We showed that we were right. And then, of course, uh, Armenia was forced to sign Capitulation Act. They would have never signed it uh, voluntarily. We forced them. Not Minsk Group. We. And uh, President Putin. This is a reality. And if not for President Putin's intervention and, uh, you know, efforts, today probably the situation would be different. But we uh, achieved what we planned. We returned all the seven occupied territories. Uh, we returned ancient Azerbaijani city of Shusha. We returned uh, Hadrut district, we returned part of Pajavan, we returned Sugovushan and others, and uh, actually achieved what we planned. Now, uh, when uh, Russian peacekeepers are uh, there, started the activity, the situation is uh, more or less stable, though I just got information uh, yesterday about some uh, terrorist acts, either by Armenian guerrilla forces or by uh, remainings of what they called Armenian army. This, of course, is of concern. I think the, the last thing which Armenia should do is to start again. Two days ago on the military parade, which uh, was devoted to our glorious victory, I said, that if Armenian fascism raises its head once again, we will smash it with an iron fist. Uh, so the last thing for them is to plan some military actions. We will destroy them completely this time. It should not be a secret for anyone. Uh, but I hope that it will not happen. So uh, peacekeeping mission is in force. You know that peacekeeping operations were part of the agreement which was discussed, was part of the Madrid principles, but we never seriously discussed it. Andrei knows, as a veteran, we even never touched on that. We had some general exchange of views, what could be composition of the peacekeepers, which countries it may represent, should they be neighbors, should they be co-chairs, there were different opinions, and I personally never elaborated on that, because I said it's uh, premature, we need to resolve the issue, and then, and we never objected peacekeepers. We said, yes, peacekeepers, they should come, and uh, certain time protect the civilians, 
uh, Armenians and Azerbaijanis, and it happens. And now peacekeeping operations is done by uh, Russia, and uh, you know, it was supported by Armenia and by Azerbaijan. At the same time, as you know, we are now already in the phase of creation of the monitoring center uh, in Agdam district of Azerbaijan, uh, the center which also was uh, reflected in the declaration which we signed on the 10th of November. Uh, Turkish-Russian monitoring center will uh, monitor the ceasefire regime. And this, I think, is also a very good sign of regional cooperation, also a good sign of cooperation between uh, Turkey and Russia. And uh, uh, this already is a reality. Uh, uh, the last point, which I also want to raise, and as I'm sure you, you heard about that, is our views for the future for the future of the region, I mean. I already a couple of times uh, publicly uh, addressed this issue, that the region uh, must uh, have new dynamics, and there should be a new development in the region. Azerbaijan is ready. Azerbaijan has a powerful from economic point of view, from military point of view, country as a country with a very broad international support, the country which today is chairing the second after United Nations international institutions, non-aligned movement is of course uh, will do its part of the job in order to provide long-lasting stability and security. But of course it also will depend on uh, Pashinyan regime or if he is, uh, this regime is overthrown on those who will come after. And I think the uh, international community should deliver the direct messages to Armenia. First, never ever in the future try to insult the feelings of Azerbaijani people. You will be severely punished. We are patient, we were preparing, we uh, did everything properly. We did not respond to the first Armenian provocation in July the way how we could. We didn't cross uh, state border, though we could. We did not seriously respond to the second Armenian provocation in August when they sent a sabotage group to kill our people. But we responded on the third one in September and responded in a way that we destroyed Armenian army and almost destroyed Armenian state and put an end to criminal uh, regime on our territory, put an end to dreams of Armenian nationalists about uh, so-called Artsakh. It does not exist. Pashinyan said Karabakh is Armenia. He was wrong, and he deserved what he got. He deserved this humiliation. Our people, our country deserve victory because the truth and international law was on our side. I will probably conclude now in order to listen to you because you, it was your idea to come. I can tell you again in front of the cameras, I did not invite Ms. Group to come. Uh, but when I was uh, informed that Ms. Group wants to come, I said, okay, I don't mind. Maybe they have something to tell me. If you want to do it in front of the cameras, it's okay. If not, I can tell them to leave. It's up to you. Yeah, I'm listening to you. Mr. President. I listen to you carefully. First of all, this is a very special day today, the 12th of December. So, uh, Remembrance Day, I had the chance to meet with your father when he was in Paris, with President Chirac, and be part of the negotiation at the time. Um, 
We understand it. Uh, as you mentioned yourself, the Kocha countries have been, uh, over the last 28 years, trying to fulfill the mandate the best they could, in the term of the mandate, to facilitate a solution between the sides. Uh, I appreciate the fact that you mentioned creative proposals. We've been working on that and, of course, trying to find a solution uh, corresponding to the willingness of the parties, just as my leaders. Uh, my government has been uh, welcoming the ceasefire at the end of the, the bloodshed. Uh, we have a very positive view of the, all the provisions of the agreement signed on, in the night of the 9th and, and the 10th. Uh, we are ready to pursue uh, the new agenda, the evolution with a totally different situation, as you mentioned yourself. Uh, to stabilize the region, to bring prosperity uh, in an impartial um, and uh, collective way. Uh, but it's up to you whether you want the Minsk Group uh, to further work on all the pending issues. Uh, yes, we do have a good basis. We are in a transition period and the future is not written. I will, of course, report to my government all the considerations that you have publicly developed now. Um, of course, our presence in Baku, as far as I understand, uh, was due to an invitation. We, I would not have come up without invitation, so there, there's probably some misunderstanding in the context, prior context to this, uh, this mission. But again, I want to thank you for uh, receiving us, hosting this meeting, and, and uh, presenting uh, for uh, my, my government and my president all, all these views that I will very faithfully uh, transmit. Thank you. I'd also like to extend my, uh, my thanks for your decision to receive us here today and your uh, hospitable welcome. Uh, thank you also for your very clear laying out of your position. Uh, as my colleague said, we will certainly report that back to our governments, although I think much, if not all, what you said, you have also said publicly, and we understand uh, your thoughts on, on the new situation on the ground. We all acknowledge and recognize that we are dealing with a new reality now. And I think the main reason we wanted to talk to you was to get a better sense from you, and you've laid out some of this, but perhaps later we have a more detailed discussion of how you see things going from here. Uh, the situation on the ground now is different. I don't know if this is how you see the future writ large, and I mean by that specifically, the Madrid principles talk about opening lines of communication, reestablishing relations, providing a, uh, a positive environment for a future of all the people in the region. If that is part of your, your vision, uh, I think there is perhaps a role that we our countries can play in helping to fulfill that. We want to understand from you how you would like to proceed. Uh, as you know, we'll be going to Yerevan after this, and we will have a similar conversation on that side. Um, and uh, perhaps we have a, a more detailed discussion uh, outside of the campus. If I may, Mr. President, thank you very much for the opportunity to be part uh, to meet with you within the group of co-chairs of the Minsk group. Uh, uh, Russia, as we know, played a part in the tripartite uh, declaration that was made, which was made and that attached a lot of importance to the implementation of the provisions of that uh, declaration. I think there is still there are still things to be done and to fully implement this document that concerns well, as you said mr president return of the people to, of the displaced persons to to the areas reconstruction of the peaceful reconstruction of the regions and of course what you outlined the future of the um, of the peaceful and well successful development of the region 
in the conditions of peace. As for the Minsk group, uh, our government uh, as always uh, stressed the importance of this group and uh, that's why we participated and still are participating in, in the group. I think the joint position of the group was uh, expressed quite recently in the statement uh, on the 3rd of December by the heads of the delegations of uh, all, all the three countries' chairs of, co-chairs of the Minsk group. Uh, the joint attitude is refle reflected there, and we will be very glad to assist where we can in uh, implementing those aims of reconstruction which you, Mr. President, has uh, laid down today.